Julie. I know our people, and I love them. Just as they do love me. Let them come. You'll see. No. Miss Julie, they don't love you. They take your food, then spit at it. You must believe me. Listen to them. Just listen to what they're singing. No, don't listen. What are they singing? They're mocking. You and me. Oh, no. How horrible. What cowards. A pack like that's always cowardly. But against such odds, there's nothing we can do but run away. Run away? Where to? We can't get out and we can't go into Kristen's room. Into mine, then. Necessity knows no rules. And you can trust me, I really am your true and devoted friend. But supposing... Supposing they were to look for you in there. I'll bolt the door. And if they try to break in, I'll shoot. Come on. Please, come. Do you promise? I swear. Julie goes quickly into his room, and he excitedly follows her. Led by the fiddler, the peasants enter in a festive attire with flowers in their hats. They put a barrel of beer and a keg of spirits, garlanded with wreaths, on the table, fetch glasses, and begin to carouse. The scene becomes a ballet. They form a ring and dance and sing and mime. Out of the wood two women came. Finally they go out, still singing. Julie comes in alone. She looks at the havoc in the kitchen, wrings her hands, then takes out her powder puff and powders her face. Jean enters in high spirits. Jean, now you see. And you heard, didn't you? Did you still think it's possible for us to stay here? No, I don't, but what can we do? Run away. Far away. Take a journey. Journey? But where to? Switzerland. The Italian lakes. Ever been there? No. Is it nice? Uh, eternal summers, oranges, and evergreens. <sighs> but what will we do there? I'll start a hotel. First-class accommodation and first-class customers. Hotel? There's life for you. New faces all the time, new languages, no time for nerves or worries, no need to look for something to do, work rolling up out of its own accord. Bells ringing night and day, trains whistling, buses coming and going, and all the time gold pieces rolling onto the counter. There's life for you. For you. And I? Mistress of the house. Ornament of the firm. With your looks and your style, oh, it's bound to be a success. Terrific. You'll sit like a queen in the office and set your slaves in motion by pressing an electric button. The guests will file past your throne and nervously lay their treasures on your table. You've no idea the way people tremble when they get their bills. I'll salt the bills when you'll sugar them with your sweetest smiles. Oh, let's get away from here. Produces a timetable. At once. By the next train. We shall be at Malmo at 6.30. Hamburg 8.40 the next morning. Frankfurt Basel by the following day, and Como by St. Gothard's Pass in, let's see, three days. Three days. That's all very well. But, Jean, you must give me courage. Tell me you love me. Come and take me in your arms. I'd like to, but I daren't. Not again in this house. I love you. That goes without saying. You can't doubt that, Miss Julie, can you? Miss? Call me Julie. There aren't any barriers between us now. I can't. As long as we're in this house, there are barriers between us. There's the past, and there's the Count. I've never been so servile to anyone as I am to him. I've only got to see his gloves on a chair to feel small. I've only to hear his bell, and I shy like a horse, even now when I look at his boots standing there so proud and stiff. I feel my back beginning to bend. Kicks the boots. It's those old, narrow-minded notions drummed into us as children. But they can soon be forgotten. You've only got to get to another country republic and people will bend themselves double before my porter's livery. Yes, double they'll bend themselves, but I shan't. I wasn't born to bend. I've got guts, I've got character, and once I reach that first branch, you'll watch me climb. Today I'm valet. Next year I'll be proprietor, and ten years I'll have made a fortune, and then I'll go to Romania, get myself decorated, and I may, only say may, mind you, end up as a count. That would be very nice. You see, in Romania one can buy a title, and then you'll be a countess after all. My countess. 
What do I care about all that? I'm putting those things behind me. Tell me you love me. Because if you don't... If you don't, what am I? I'll tell you a thousand times over. Later. But not here. No sentimentality now, or everything will be lost. We must consider this thing calmly like reasonable people. Takes a cigar, cuts, and lights it. You sit down there, and I'll sit here and we'll talk as if nothing had happened. My God, have you no feelings at all? Nobody has more. But I know how to control them. A short time ago you were kissing my shoe. And now... And now, yes, that was then. Now we have something else to think about. Don't speak to me so brutally. I'm not. Just sensibly. One folly's been committed. Don't let's have more. The Count will be back at any moment, and we've got to settle our future before that. Now, what do you think of my plans? Do you approve? It seems a very good idea, but just one thing. Such a big undertaking would need a lot of capital. Have you got any? Jean, chewing his cigar. I certainly have. I've got my professional skill, my wide experience, and my knowledge of foreign languages. That's capital worth having, it seems to me. But it won't buy even one railway ticket. Quite true. That's why I need a backer to advance some ready cash. How can you get all that at a moment's notice? You must get it, if you want to be my partner. I can't. I haven't any money of my own. <sighs> then the whole thing's off. And? We go on as we are. Do you think I'm going to stay under this roof as your mistress? With everyone pointing at me? Do you think I can face my father after all of this? No. Take me away from here, away from this shame, this humiliation. Oh my God, what have I done? My God, my God. Weeps. So that's the tune now, is it? What have you done? Same as many before you. And now you despise me. I'm falling, I'm falling. Fall as far as me and I'll lift you up again. Why was I so terribly attracted to you? The weak to the strong, the falling to the rising. Or was it love? Is that love? Do you know what love is? Do I? You bet I do. Do you think I never had a girl before? The things you say, the things you think. That's what life's taught me. And that's what I am. It's no good getting hysterical or giving yourself airs. We're both in the same boat now. Here, let me give you a glass of something special. Opens the drawer, takes out the bottle of wine, and fills two used glasses. Where did you get that wine? From the cellar. My father's burgundy. Why not, for his son-in-law? And I drink beer. That only shows your taste not so good as mine. Thief! Are you going to tell on me? The accomplice of a petty thief! Was I blind drunk? Have I dreamt this whole night, midsummer eve, the night for innocent merrymaking? Innocent? <laughs> Is anyone on earth as wretched as I am now? Why should you be, after such a conquest? What about Kristen in there? Don't you think she has any feelings? I did think so. But I don't any longer. No, a menial is a menial. And a whore is a whore. Julie, falling to her knees, her hands clasped. Oh, God in heaven, put an end to my miserable life. Lift me out of this filth I'm sinking. Save me, save me. I must admit I'm sorry for you. When I was in the onion bed and saw you up there among the roses, I... Yes, I'll tell you about it now. I had the same dirty thoughts as all boys. You who wanted to die because of me. And the outspin? That was just talk. Lies, you mean. More or less. I think I read a story in some paper about a chimney sweep who shut himself up in a chest full of lilac because he'd been summoned for not supporting some brat. So this is what you're like. I had to think up something. It's always the fancy stuff that catches the woman. Beast! Merd. Now you've seen the falcon's back. Not exactly its back. 
I was to be the first branch, but the branch was rotten. I was to be a hotel sign, and I the hotel. Sit at your counter, manage your clients, and cook their accounts. I'd have done that myself. That any human being could be so steeped in filth. Clean it up, then. Menial. Lackey. Stand up when I speak to you. Menials, whore, lackeys, harlot, shut your mouth and get out of here. Are you the one to lecture me for being coarse? Nobody of my kind would ever be as coarse as you were tonight. Do you think any servant girl would throw herself at a man that way? Have you ever seen a girl of my class asking for it like that? I haven't. Only animals and prostitutes. Go on. Hit me, trample on me. It's all I deserve. I'm rotten. But help me, if there's any way out at all, help me. I'm not denying myself a share in honor of seducing you. But do you think anybody in my place would have dared look in your direction if yourself hadn't asked for it? I'm still amazed. And proud. Why not? Though I must admit the victory was too easy to make me lose my head. Go on hitting me. Jean, rising. No. On the contrary, I apologize for what I've said. I don't hit a person who's down. Least of all a woman. I can't deny there's a certain satisfaction in finding what dazzled one below was just moonshine. That that falcon's back is gray after all. That there's powder on the lovely cheeks that polished nails can have black tips. That the handkerchief is dirty although it smells of scent. On the other hand, it hurts to find that what I was struggling to reach wasn't high and isn't real. It hurts to see you fallen so low you're far lower than your own cook. Hurts like when you see the last flowers of summer lashed to pieces by rain and turned to mud. You're talking as if you're already my superior. I am. I might make you a countess, but you can never make me a count, you know. But I am the child of a count, and you can never be that. True. But I might be the father of counts if... You're a thief. I'm not. There are worse things than being a thief. Much lower. Besides, when I'm in a place, I regard myself as a member of the family to some extent, as one of the children. You don't call it stealing when children pinch a berry from overladen bushes. His passion is roused again. Miss Julie, you are a glorious woman, far too good for a man like me. You were carried away by some kind of madness, and now you're trying to cover up your mistake by persuading yourself you're in love with me. You're not, although you may find me physically attractive, which means your love's no better than mine. But I wouldn't be satisfied with being nothing but an animal for you, and I could never make you love me. Are you sure? You think there's a chance? Of my loving you, yes, of course. You are beautiful, refined, takes her hand, educated, and you can be nice when you want to be. The fire you kindle in a man isn't likely to go out. Puts his arm round her. You're like mulled wine, full of spices, and your kisses. Tries to pull her to him, but she breaks away. Let go of me. You won't win me that way. Not that way, how then? Not by kisses and fine speeches. Not by planning the future and saving you from shame. How then? How? How? I don't know. There isn't any way. I loathe you. I loathe you as I loathe rats, but I can't escape from you. Escape with me. Julie, pulling herself together. Escape? Yes, we must escape. But I'm so tired. Give me a glass of wine. He pours it out. She looks at her watch. First we must talk. We still have a little time. Empties the glass and holds it out for more. Don't drink like that. You'll get tipsy. What's that matter? What's it matter? It's vulgar to get drunk. Well, what have you got to say? We've got to run away. But we must talk first, or rather I must, for so far you've done all the talking. You've told me about your life, now I want to tell you about mine, so that we really know each other before we begin this journey together. Wait. Excuse my saying so, but don't you think you may be sorry afterwards if you give away your secrets to me? 
Aren't you my friend? On the whole. But don't rely on me. You can't mean that. But anyway, everyone knows my secrets. Listen, my mother wasn't well-born. She came of quite humble people and was brought up with all those new ideas of sex equality and women's rights and so on. She thought marriage was quite wrong. So when my father proposed to her, she said she would never become his wife. But in the end, she did. I came into the world as far as I can make out against my mother's will. And I was left to run wild, but I had to do all things a boy does to prove women are as good as men. I had to wear boys' clothes, I was taught to handle horses, and I wasn't allowed in the dairy. She made me groom and harness and go out hunting. I even had to try and plow. All the men on the estate were given the women's jobs, and the women the men's, until the whole place went to rack and ruin, and we were the laughing stock of the entire neighborhood. At last, my father seems to have come to his senses and rebelled. He changed everything and ran the place his own way. My mother got ill. I don't know what was the matter with her, but she used to have strange attacks and hide herself in the attic or the garden. Sometimes she stayed out all night. Then came the great fire which you have heard people talking about. The house and the stables and the barns, the whole place burnt to the ground. In very suspicious circumstances. Because the accident happened the very day the insurance had to be renewed. And my father had sent the new premium, but through some carelessness of the messenger it arrived too late. Refills her glass and drinks. Don't drink any more. Oh, what does it matter? We were destitute and had to sleep in the carriages. My father didn't know how to get money to rebuild, and then my mother suggested he should borrow from an old friend of hers, a local brick manufacturer. Drinks. My father got the loan, and to his surprise, without having to pay interest. So the place was rebuilt. Do you know who set fire to it? Your lady mother. Do you know who the brick manufacturer was? Your mother's lover? Do you know whose the money was? Wait. No, I, I don't know that. It was my mother's. In other words, the Count's. Unless there was a settlement. There wasn't any settlement. My mother had a little money of her own which she didn't want my father to control. So she invested it with her... friend. Who grabbed it. Exactly. He appropriated it. My father came to know all this. He couldn't bring an action, couldn't pay his wife's lover, nor prove it was his wife's money. That was my mother's revenge. Because he made himself master in his own house. He nearly shot himself then. At least there was a rumor he tried and didn't bring it off. So he went on living. And my mother had to pay dearly for what she's done. Imagine what those five years were like for me. My natural sympathies were with my father, yet I took my mother's side, because I didn't know the facts. I learned from her to hate and distrust men. You know how she loathed the whole male sex, and I swore to her I'd never become the slave of any man. And so you got engaged to that attorney, so that he would be my slave. But he wouldn't be. Oh yes, he wanted to be, but he didn't have the chance. I got bored with him. Is that what I saw? In the stable yard? What did you see? What I saw was him breaking off the engagement. That's a lie. It was I who broke it off. Did he say it was him? The cad. He's not a cad. Do you hate men, Miss Julie? Yes. Most of the time. But when that weakness comes, oh, the shame... Then do you hate me? Beyond words. I'd gladly have killed you like an animal. Quick as you shot a mad dog, eh? Yes. But there's nothing here to shoot with. And there isn't a dog. So what do we do now? Go abroad. To make each other miserable for the rest of our lives? No. To enjoy ourselves for a day or two. For a week, for as long as enjoyment lasts, and then to die. <laughs> die? 
How silly. I think it would be far better to start a hotel. Julie, without listening. Die on the shores of Lake Como, where the sun always shines and at Christmas time there are green trees and glowing oranges. Lake Como's a rainy hole and I didn't see any oranges outside the shops. But it's a good place for tourists. Plenty of villas to be rented by, uh, honeymoon couples. Profitable business, that. Know why? Because they all sign a lease for six months and all leave after three weeks. Why? They quarrel, of course. But the rent has to be paid just the same. And then it's let again. So it goes on and on. For there's plenty of love, although it doesn't last long. You don't want to die with me? I don't want to die at all. For one thing, I like living. And for another, I consider suicide a sin against the creator who gave us life. You believe in God. You. Yes, of course. And I go to church every Sunday. Look here, I'm tired of all of this. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Indeed. And do you think I'm going to leave things like this? Don't you know what you owe the woman you've ruined? Jean, taking out his purse and throwing a silver coin on the table. There you are. I don't want to be in anybody's debt. Julie, pretending not to notice the insult. Don't you know what the law is? There's no law, unfortunately, that punishes a woman for seducing a man. But can you see anything for it but to go abroad, get married, and then divorce? What if I refuse this mesalliance? Mesalliance? Yes, for me. I'm better bred than you are, see? Nobody in my family committed arson. Well, you can't prove otherwise, because we haven't any family records outside the registrar's office. But I've seen your family tree in that book on the drawing room table. Do you know who the founder of your family was? A miller who let his wife sleep with the king one night during the Danish war. I haven't any ancestors like that. I haven't any ancestors at all, but I might become one. This is what I get for confiding in someone so low, for sacrificing my family honor, dishonor. Well, I told you so. One shouldn't drink, because then one talks. And one shouldn't talk. Oh, how ashamed I am, how bitterly ashamed. If at least you loved me. Look here, for the last time, what do you want? Am I to burst into tears? Am I to jump over your riding whip? Shall I kiss you and carry you off to Lake Como for three weeks after which? What am I to do? What do you want? This is getting unbearable, but that's what comes about from playing around with women. Miss Julie, I can see how miserable you are. I know you're going through hell, but I don't understand you. We don't have scenes like this. We don't go in for hating each other. We make love for fun in our spare time, but we haven't all day and all night for it like you. I think you must be ill. I'm sure you're ill. Then you must be kind to me. You sound almost human now. Well, be human yourself. You spit at me, then won't let me wipe it off. On you. Help me. Help me. Tell me what to do, where to go. Jesus, as if I knew. I've been mad, raving mad, but there must be a way out. Stay here and keep quiet. Nobody knows anything. I can't. People do know. Kristen knows. They don't know and they wouldn't believe such a thing. But it might happen again. That's true. And there might be consequences. Consequences. Fool that I am, I never thought of that. Yes, there's nothing for it but to go. At once. I can't come with you, that would be a complete giveaway. You must go alone, abroad, anywhere. Alone? Where to? I can't. You must. And before the Count gets back. If you stay, we know what will happen. Once you've sinned, you feel you might as well go on and the harm's done. Then you get more and more reckless, and in the end you're found out. No, you must go abroad. Then write to the Count and tell him everything, except that it was me. He'll never guess that, and I don't think he'll want to. I'll go if you come with me. Are you crazy, woman? Miss Julie elopes with valet. Next day it would be in the headlines, and the Count would never live it down. I can't go. I can't stay. I'm so tired. I'm so completely worn out. Give me orders. 
set me going. I can't think of any more. I can't act. You see what weaklings you are. Why do you give yourselves airs and turn up your noses as if you're the lords of creation? Very well. I'll give you your orders. Go upstairs and dress. Get money for the journey and come down here again. Come up with me. To your room. Now you've gone crazy again. No. Go along at once. Takes her hand and pulls her to the door. Julie, as she goes. Speak kindly to me, Jean. Orders always sound unkind. Now you know. Now you know. Left alone, Jean sighs with relief, sits down at the table, takes out a notebook and pencil, and adds up figures, now and then aloud. Dawn begins to break. Kristen enters dressed for church, carrying his white dickey and tie. Kristen. Oh, Jesus, look at the state the place is in. What have you been up to? Turns out the lamp. Oh, Miss Julie invited the crowd in. Did you sleep through it? Didn't you hear anything? I slept like a log. And dressed for church already. Yes. He promised to come to communion with me today. Why, so I did. And you've got my bib and tucker. Come on, then. Sits. Kristen begins to put his things on. Pause. Sleepily. What's the lesson today? It's about the beheading of John the Baptist, I think. <laughs> That's sure to be horribly long. Hey, you're choking me. Oh, Lord, I'm so sleepy. So sleepy. Yes, what have you been up doing all night? You look absolutely green. Just sitting here, talking with Miss Julie. She doesn't know it's proper, that one. I say, Kristen. What? It's queer, really, isn't it? When you come to think of it. Her? What's queer? The whole thing. Kristen, looking at the half-filled glass on the table. Have you been drinking together, too? Yes. More shame, you. Look me straight in the face. Yes. Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes, it is. Oh, this I would never have believed. How low! You're not jealous of her, surely. No, I'm not. If it had been Clara or Sophie, I'd have scratched your eyes out. But not of her. I don't know why. That's how it is, though. But it's disgusting. You're angry with her, then? No, with you. It was wicked of you, very, very wicked. Poor girl. And mark my words, I won't stay here any longer now, in a place where one can't respect one's employers. Why should one respect them? You should know since you're so smart. But you don't want to stay in the service of people who aren't respectable, do you? I wouldn't demean myself. But it's rather a comfort to find out they're no better than us. I don't think so. If they're no better than us, there's nothing for us to live up to. And, oh, think of the Count. Think of him. He's been through so much already. No, I... I won't stay in the place any longer. A fellow like you, too. If it had been that attorney now or somebody of her own class. Why? What's wrong with, oh, you're all right in your own way, but when all's said and done, there's a difference between one class and another. No, this is something I'll never be able to stomach. That our young lady was so proud and so down on men you never believed she let one come near her should go and give herself to one like you. She who wanted to have poor Diana shot for running after the lodge keeper's pug. No, I must say. Well, I won't stay here any longer. On the 24th of October, I quit. And then? Well, since you mention it, it's about time you began to look around, if we're ever going to get married. But what am I to look for? I shan't get a place like this when I'm married. I know you won't, but you might get a job as porter or caretaker in some public institution. 
Government rations are small but sure, and there's a pension for the widow and children. That's all very fine, but it's not in my line to start thinking at once about dying for my wife and children. I must say I had rather big ideas. You and your ideas. You've got obligations too, and you better start thinking about them. Don't you start pestering me about obligations. I've had enough of that. Listens to a sound upstairs. Anyway, we've plenty of time to work things out. Go and get ready now, and we'll be off to church. Who's that walking about upstairs? Don't know. Unless it's Clara. Kristen, going. You don't think the Count could have come back without our hearing him? The Count? No, he can't have. He'd have rung for me. God help us. I never known such goings on. Exit. The sun has now risen and is shining on the treetops. The light gradually changes until it slants in through the windows. Jean goes to the door and beckons. Julie enters in traveling clothes carrying a small bird cage covered with a cloth which she puts on a chair. I'm ready. Hush! Kristen's up. Julie, in a very nervous state. Does she suspect anything? Not a thing. But my God, what a sight you are. Sight? What do you mean? You're white as a corpse and, pardon me, your face is dirty. Let me wash then. Goes to the sink and washes her face and hands. There. Give me a towel. Oh, the sun is rising. And that breaks the spell. Yes. The spell of Midsummer Eve. But listen, Jean. Come with me. I've got the money. Enough. Enough to start with. Come with me. I can't travel alone today. It's midsummer day, remember? I'd be packed into a suffocating train among crowds of people who'd all stare at me, and it would stop at every station while I yearned for wings. No, I can't do that. I simply can't. There will be memories, too. Memories of midsummer days when I was little. The leafy church, birch and lilac, the gaily springing dinner table relatives, friends, evening in the park, dancing and music and flowers and fun... Oh, however far you run away, there will always be memories of the baggage car and remorse and guilt. I will come with you. But quickly now then, before it's too late. At once. Put on your things. Picks up cage. No luggage mind. That would give us away. No, only what we can take with us in the carriage. Jean, fetching his hat. What on earth have you got there? Only my green finch. I don't want to leave it behind. Well, I'll be damned. Or to take a bird cage along, are we? You're crazy. Put that cage down. It's the only thing I'm taking from my home. The only living creature who cares for me since Diana went off like that. Don't be cruel. Let me take it. Put that cage down, I tell you. And don't talk so loud. Kristen will hear. No, I won't leave it in strange hands. I'd rather you killed it. Give the little beast here, then I'll wring its neck. But don't hurt it. Don't... No... I can't. Give it here. I can. Julie, taking the bird out of the cage and kissing it. Dear little Serena, must you die and leave your mistress? Please don't make a scene. It's your life and future we're worrying about. Come on, quick now. He snatches the bird from her, puts it on a board, and picks up a chopper. Julie turns away. You should have learned how to kill chickens instead of target shooting. You wouldn't faint at a drop of blood. Julie, screaming, Kill me too! Kill me too! You can butcher an innocent creature without a quiver! Oh, how I hate you! How I loathe you! There is blood between us now. I curse the hour I first saw you. I curse the hour I was conceived in my mother's womb. What's the use of cursing? Let's go. Julie, going on the chopping block as if drawn against her will. No, I won't go yet. I can't. I must look. Listen, there's a carriage. Listens without taking your eyes off the board and chopper. You don't think I can bear the sight of blood. You think I'm so weak. Oh, how I should like to see your blood and your brains on a chopping block. 
I'd like to see the whole of your sex swimming like that in the sea of blood. I think I could drink out of your skull, bathe my feet in your broken breast, and eat your heart roasted whole. You think I'm weak? You think I love you, that my womb yearn for your seed, and I want to carry your offspring under my heart and nourish it with my blood? You think I want to bear your child and take your name? By the way, what is your name? I've never heard of your surname. I don't suppose you've got one. I should be Mrs. Hovel or Madame Dunghill. Your dog wearing my collar, your lackey with my crest on your buttons. I share you with my cook, with my own servant's rival. Oh. You think I'm a coward. I will run away. No, now I'm going to stay and let the storm break. My father will come back, find his desk broken open, his money gone. Then he'll ring that bell twice for the valet, and then he'll send for the police. And I shall tell them everything, everything. Oh, how wonderful to make an end of it all. A real end. He has a stroke and dies, and that's the end of all of us. Just peace and quietness. Eternal rest. The coat of arms broken on the coffin, and the Count's line extinct. But the valet's line goes on in an orphanage, wins laurels in the gutter, and ends in jail. There speaks the noble blood. Bravo, Miss Julie. But now don't let the cat out of the bag. Kristen enters dressed for church, carrying a prayer book. Julie rushes to her and flings herself into her arms for protection. Help me, Kristen. Protect me from this man. Kristen, unmoved and cold. What goings on for a feast day morning? Sees the board. And what a filthy mess. What's it all about? Why are you screaming and carrying on so? Kristen, you're a woman and my friend. Beware of that scoundrel. Jean, embarrassed. While you ladies are talking things over, I'll go and shave. Slips into his room. You must understand. You must listen to me. I certainly don't understand such loose ways. Where are you off to in those traveling clothes? And he had his hat on, didn't he? Eh? Listen, Kristen. Listen, I'll tell you everything. I don't want to know anything. You must listen. What to? Your nonsense with Jean? I don't care a rap about that. It's nothing to do with me. But if you're thinking of getting him to run off with you, we'll soon put a stop to that. Julie, very nervously. Please try to be calm, Kristen, and listen. I can't stay here, nor can Jean, so we must go abroad. Hmm. But you see, I've had an idea. Supposing we all three go abroad to Switzerland and start a hotel together. I've got some money, you see. Jean and I could run the whole thing. And I thought you would take charge of the kitchen. Wouldn't that be splendid? Say yes, do. If you come with us, everything will be fine. Oh, do say yes. Puts her arms around Kristen. Kristen, coolly thinking. You've never traveled, Kristen. You should go abroad and see the world. You have no idea how nice it is traveling by train. New faces all the time in new countries. On our way through Hamburg, we'll go to the zoo. You'll love that. And we'll go to the theater and the opera too. And when we get to Munich, there'll be the museums, dear. And, and pictures by Rubens and Raphael. The great painters, you know. You've heard of Munich, haven't you? Where King Ludwig lived, you know, the king who went mad? We'll see his castles. So, some of his castles are still just like in fairy tales. And from there, it's not far to Switzerland. And the Alps. Think of the Alps, Kristen, dear, covered with snow in the middle of summer. And there are oranges there and trees th that are green the whole year round. Jean is seen in the door of his room, sharpening his razor on a stop, which he holds with his teeth and his left hand. He listens to the talk with satisfaction and now and then nods approval. Julie continues, And then we'll go to a hotel, and I'll sit at the desk while Jean receives the guests, and goes up marketing and writes letters. There's life for you. Trains whistling, buses driving up, bells ringing upstairs and downstairs, and I shall make out the bills, and I shall cook them too. You've no idea how nervous travelers are when it comes to paying their bills. And you, you'll sit like a queen in the kitchen, 
Of course, there won't be any standing at the stove for you. You'll always have to be nicely dressed and ready to be seen, and with your looks... No, I'm not flattering you. One fine day, you'll catch yourself a husband. Some rich Englishman, I, I wouldn't wonder. They're the ones who are easy to catch. And then we'll get rich and build ourselves a villa on Lake Como. Of course, it rains there a little now and then, but the sun must shine there too sometimes, even though it seems gloomy. And if not, then we can come home again, come back here or somewhere else. Look here, Miss Julie. Do you believe all that yourself? Do I believe it? Yes. I don't know. I don't believe anything anymore. Sinks down on the bench, her head in her arms on the table. Nothing. Nothing at all. Kristen turns to Jean. So you meant to beat it, did you? Jean, disconcerted, putting the razor on the table. Beat it? What are you talking about? You've heard Miss Julie's plan, and though she's tired now with being up all night, it's a perfectly sound plan. Oh, is it? If you thought I'd work for that, kindly use decent language in front of your mistress. Mistress? Yes. Well, well. Just listen to that. Yes. It would be a good thing if you did listen and talked less. Miss Julie is your mistress. And what's made you lose your respect for her now ought to make you feel the same about yourself. I've always had enough self-respect to despise other people, not to go below my own station. Has the Count's cook ever gone with the groom or the swineherd? Tell me that. No. You were lucky enough to have a high-class chap for your beau. High-class, all right. Selling the oats out of the Count's stable. You're a fine one to talk taking a commission on the groceries and bribes from the butcher. What the devil? And now you can't feel any respect for your employers. You. You. Are you coming to church with me? I should think you need a good sermon after your fine deeds. No. I'm not going to church today. You can go alone and confess your own sins. Yes. I'll do that and bring back enough forgiveness to cover yours, too. The Savior suffered and died on the cross for all our sins, and if we go to him with faith and a penitent heart, he takes all our sins upon himself. Even grocery thefts? Do you believe that, Kristen? That is my living faith, as sure as I stand here. The faith I learned as a child and have kept ever since, Miss Julie. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Oh, if I had your faith, but you see you can't have it without God's special grace, and it's not given to all to have that. Who is it given, then? That's the great secret of the working of grace, Miss Julie. God is no respecter of persons, and with him the last shall be first. Then I suppose he does not respect the last and it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That's how it is, Miss Julie. Now I'm going, alone, and on my way I shall tell the groom not to let any of the horses out, in case anyone should want to leave before the Count gets back. Goodbye. Exit. What a devil. And all on account of a greenfinch. Never mind the greenfinch. Do you see any way out of this, any end to it? No. If you were in my place, what would you do? In your place? Wait a bit. If I was a woman, a lady of rank who had... fallen. I don't know. Yes, I do know now. Julie, picking up the razor and making a gesture. This... Yes, but I wouldn't do it, you know. There's a difference between us. Because you're a man and I'm a woman. What is the difference? The usual difference. 
between man and woman. Julie, holding the razor. I'd like to, but I can't. My father couldn't either that time he wanted to. No. He didn't want to. He had to be revenged first. And now my mother's revenged again. Through me. Didn't you ever love your father, Miss Julie? Deeply. But I hated him too. Unconsciously. And he let me be brought up to despise my own sex. To be half woman, half man. Whose fault is what's happened? My father's, my mother's, or my own? My own? I haven't anything that's my own. I haven't one single thought that I didn't get from my father, one emotion that didn't come from my mother, and as for this last idea all about people being equal, I got that from him. My fiancé. That's why I called him a cad. How can it be my fault? Push the responsibilities onto Jesus like Kristen does? No. I'm too proud and, thanks to my father's teaching, too intelligent. As for all that about a rich person not being able to get into heaven, it's just a lie. But Kristen, who has money in the savings bank, will certainly not get in. Whose fault is it? What does it matter whose fault it is? In any case, I must take the blame and bear the consequences. Yes, but... There are two sharp rings on the bell. Julie jumps to her feet. Jean changes into his livery. The count is back. Supposing Kristen... Goes to the speaking tube, presses it, and listens. Has he been to his desk yet? This is Jean, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. At once, sir? Very good, sir. In half an hour. What, what did he say? My God, what did he say? He ordered his boots and his coffee in half an hour. Then there's half an hour. Oh, I'm so tired. I can't do anything. Can't be sorry. Can't run away. Can't stay. Can't live. Can't... Die. Help me. Order me and I'll obey like a dog. Do me this last service. Save my honor. Save his name. You know what I ought to do, but haven't the strength to do. Use your strength and order me to do it. I don't know why. I can't now. I don't understand. It's just as if this coat made me. I can't give you orders. And now that the Count has spoken to me, I can't quite explain, but... Well, that devil of a lackey is bending my back again. I believe if the Count came down now and ordered me to cut my throat, I'd do it on the spot. Then pretend you're him and I'm you. You did some fine acting before when you knelt to me and played the aristocrat. Or... Have you ever seen a hypnotist at the theater? He nods. He says to the person, Take the broom. And he takes it. He says sweep, and he sweeps. But the person has to be asleep. Julie, as if in a trance. I am asleep already. The whole room has turned to smoke. And you look like a stove. A stove like a man in black with a tall hat. Your eyes are glowing like coals when the fire is low and your face is a white patch like ashes. The sunlight has now reached the floor and lights up Jean. How nice and warm it is. She holds out her hand as though warming them at a fire. And so light, so peaceful. Jean, putting the razor in her hand. Here is the broom. Go now while it's light, out to the barn, and whispers in her ear. Julie, waking. Thank you. I'm going now, to rest. 
but just tell me that even the first can receive the gift of grace. The first? No. No, I can't tell you that. But wait. Miss Julie, I've got it. You aren't one of the first any longer. You're one of the last. That's true. I'm one of the very last. I am the last. Oh, but I can't go. Tell me again to go. No. I can't now either. I can't. And the first shall be last. Don't think. Don't think. You're taking my strength away too and making me a coward. What's that? I thought I saw the bell move. To be so frightened of a bell. Yes, but it's not just a bell. There's somebody behind it. A hand moving it, and something else moving the hand. And if you stop your ears, if you stop your ears, yes, it rings louder than ever. Rings and rings until you answer. And then it's too late. Then the police come and... and... The bell rings twice loudly. Gene flinches, then straightens himself up. It's horrible. But there's no other way to end it. Go. Julie walks firmly out the door. Curtain. And that is the end of our two plays by August Strindberg. The first one being called The Stronger, and the second, Miss Julie. I hope that you enjoyed these plays. It allowed me to be a bit more crazy than I have been in the past. It's always fun when you get to try and stop being, everything is so serious all the time, and then you just get to kind of go loose and just be like, eh, we're having a mental breakdown. It's always a fun time to go about that. And my body totally wasn't shaking at that point. As always, if you could show your support by liking or subscribing, or whatever in your particular social media uses, I greatly appreciate that. And share it with your friends, your theater friends, your speech friends, uh, even if it's just to mock me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. Thank you.